So we've been running our Haas EC400 horizontal machining center with pallet pool for several months now. And in this episode, we're gonna take a look back. I'm gonna show you the rest of the installation process, do a final walk around, as well as show you how we implemented our row devices and how I kind of accidentally invented a brand new product to help alleviate the problems associated with migrating from a three axis vertical to a four axis horizontal. Let's get started. Okay, so here we are, it's day two. We're about halfway through the installation process. Things are going smoothly. There's some hiccups. There was a, a cable that was a little too short. Factory jumped on it, uh, next day air delivery got the right cable. It's basically the cable that runs from the pallet pool to the control box. And we're just waiting for the technicians to show up. They're at lunch right now. And they're just gonna keep going, getting everything dialed in. I mean, it's a really complicated machine. You know, a VF2s, fours, uh, VM3, uh, those are one day installs. UMC is about two day. They said this is about a four or five day install. So we're right on track for that. So let's walk. We got a lot of panels around that are open. I'll give you a peek inside. Let's go there, around this side. So here we are on the right side of the machine. This is kind of like the back side of the machine, if you will. You have the chips that come out, you have the utilities. Of course, the electrical cabinet faces the operator and then you have the air cabinet. Back behind me, this is just more guarding of the 100 tool carousel. But now that there's a panel off, I thought it'd be really interesting to take a look at this. Now, one of the things that makes horizontals so rigid is Haas uses a step design. So you don't have the linear rails on uh, one plane, they're on two different planes. So it's trying to twist itself in multiple planes. So it's a little bit more uh, rigid. Also, if you were to look at the spacing between the linear rails and then the distance from that front linear rail to the tip of the spindle, uh, that's a lot shorter. Uh, than the spacing of the two linear rails. Uh, Haas has also made a lot of improvements to the chip evacuation. Uh, when we come around the front, you'll see that there are lots of nozzles. It's like a shower in there, getting chips down into the center of the casting, out through the center of the machine, and into your chip pin. And even chips that end up in the pallet pool, those wash down into the center trough of the belt style chip conveyor. So, so far taking a close look at the inside of the machine, I'm really impressed with kind of the design, uh, not just uh, engineering, but the aesthetics of how everything is neatly routed. Let's keep moving. This is the tool changer. It's a hundred position tool changer. It's like a giant Ferris wheel. I'm almost tempted the kid in me to like hold on and do some type of stunt where I ride it, but we're not gonna do that, at least not on camera. Uh, it's really neat. It's a pretty simplified design. It's a five piece aluminum casting. There's five segments that make up the wheel. It's chain driven. Uh, most tool carousels, it's just got a kind of like a, a servo with a worm gear. This is chain driven and that makes sense. A lot of torque. If you did the math and said that the max tool weight, uh, is it 12 pounds per tool? And if you max it out, it would be 1200 pounds of tools hanging on that axle. So it's pretty impressive of a device. Uh, so this door, you can change tools while the machine is running. It's got its own station, uh, turret forward and back. It's, I'm gonna change the tool, go ahead, automatic mode, and of course your obligatory e-stop. So this is the pallet pool, six stations, including the loading station to my left, and then the APC, uh, I don't know, exchange station, which would normally be a panel here where an operator would stand. But basically this rotates, picks up the pallet and drops it off or delivers it to the loading unloading station. So I was really impressed with this. It's a dedicated casting down below. It has this kind of saddle with linear rails. This is not anything that I expected. I thought it'd be pretty simple, like pneumatically driven or something like that, but it is its own servo driven device. The ability to hold pallets uh, is limited to 500 pounds. So this is one thing that I had to think about. I considered ordering a tombstone with four uh, double vices on it. But when you looked at the weight, it was about 800 pounds. 
which the EC400 has something like a, it's about 900 pounds uh, pallet capacity, but this one is down to 500, which is fine. We actually have one of our products that we're considering launching for this. Definitely we're gonna use our product as a prototype stage in this machine, but I wanted to make sure that the weight limit would support uh, our product, and it does. So let's wrap up by heading around the front of the machine again. So if we're using this machine correctly, this is where the operators will spend the majority of their time in the unload load station. So really simple design, rotating door. It has a trough here. It has this tray that slides in and out. That's where you're gonna catch the majority of your chips. Hopefully chips are pesky, they get everywhere. But this makes it really convenient to just simply pull out, dump, vacuum, whatever you want. Once the pallet is delivered here, you have a simple lever pull it and you can rotate it pretty effortlessly. Locks in, service it, air gun, everything that you would expect working at a three axis machine, it's all within fingertips. Um, now, when we're doing our setups, that's where this is gonna be, where you're gonna be doing most of the work. So this feels just like any other, whether it's a VF2 or a UMC, it's just a mill, it's just on its side. Now, when I developed the Rotovice, I looked at the productivity that these horizontals could deliver. Multiple parts, multiple faces. Essentially, if we put a Rotovice on this, or, well, it would be called a tombstone, just a giant tombstone, and you have the spindle face in this way and a rotary unit here, all we did with the Rotovice is we turned it like this. And so we have a vertical machine and a, ro a rotary unit with our compact row device, it's the same thing. So I owned and operated and used fourth axis indexers and the row device for about six years. And we've been selling it for four of those years. And so we're kind of coming full circle where what we modeled after the horizontal approach, now we have the horizontal. So of course we're gonna develop new work holding for horizontals and being with kind of our, our uh, uh, our focus as a company, Pearson Work Holding, it's high density work holding, quick changeovers. We want to get that inefficiency of the loading and unloading time uh, reduced to a minimum. For now, we're going to let the uh, technicians come back, finish up the install, and then we'll start making some chips. weeks later. Okay, we are standing at the load station of the pallet pool. Now the pallet pool holds six pallets and there's a total of seven. The seventh pallet is in the machine being machined. Now when that finishes, it delivers the just finished pallet to the load station so that the operator can change parts. Now, if you followed the channel for a while, you'll notice this from Fixture Friday 14, in which we hold eight parts at a time using our Rotovice pallets. But in that Fixture Friday, we were holding the Rotovice in a three axis machine using a fourth axis rotary indexer. Now, when it came to adapting that program and that approach to this machine, we only had to do one thing. We changed the orientation of the origin to match this. Now we've set it up so that the Rotovice is perfectly centered on this platter, so it spins on center. And then the origin is just flipped over 90 degrees because in a horizontal, remember this is X, this is Y, and this is Z. So just two axes get flopped. Now, when this goes into the machine, keep in mind the old one comes out. So we did have to double the number of pallets and obviously get another Rotovice, but it is worth the extra cost and the extra investment to have this much efficiency in productivity. Now, after the first few hours, the guys were going, wow, this is remarkably faster when you do the math and consider the per part cycle time. That's why horizontal machining centers are so efficient. You virtually almost eliminate 
the idle spindle time because once it's done, it switches the two pallets. And then the slower part of changing parts is done outside of the spindle enclosure. Now, when it came to adapting the rotovice to the horizontal, we did have to make this riser. And there's two reasons. Number one is the limit of travel is actually two inches above the surface of this platter. So going two inches up is the lowest that the spindle can go. Plus raising it up a little bit just makes it a little more ergonomic for the operator to be working at chest height. And also it kind of puts it in the sweet spot of the machine. It's not at the very bottom. We don't have chip clearance issues. It just plenty of, it provides plenty of space for chips to flush. Now on that subject, I designed this riser. I would not do this again. It was probably a five minute design infusion. I would have created larger radiuses so that we would not get chips collecting on these socket cap screws. That's what happens when you rush. You prioritize speed, you're bound to make mistakes, or you don't invest the right amount of time required to have a good design. So this has been redesigned. Now, I talked about needing to double everything. That's not exactly true. The only thing we needed to double is we needed to add another rotovice to our setup because we already had eight rotovice pallets. Because keep in mind, the approach that you wanna use with palletized work holding is while one set of pallets is inside the machine being machined, the second set of pallets is outside and you're doing the slow changeovers of undoing all these cap screws, swapping out finished parts for new raw material. So we didn't have to cut new pallets. We just keep them in. We don't take these pallets out. We just change the parts at the pallet station. Now, when I saw this, a light bulb went off. I realized, wait a minute, we're palletizing. We're not swapping out the pallets. We're changing parts because that's the approach you want to use with the horizontal. We need to palletize our horizontal so that it uses our existing technology, namely our pro pallet system. That led to the development of our newest product. That's in the machine right now. Let's take a look. Introducing the Pearson Workholding Horizontal Pallet System. This has been a dream setup for this machine. The reason is you only buy the main tombstone one time and then the faces are customized for whatever job or setup you want. Because I was gonna spend a lot of money on individual tombstones for different individual components, but going with our horizontal pallet system allowed us to do two things. Number one, create higher density on four sides and keep the cost of those fixtures low. And number two, take our existing pallets that were used on our pro pallet system in a three axis vertical CNC machining center application and adapt them day one to our horizontal machine. Suffice it to say, the guys have loved this. Now, what caught us off guard was we didn't even have to change the programs. Because if you look at this, remember, this is X, this is Y, this is Z. The whole spindle is simply just rotated from when you're looking into the machine as a, a three axis vertical, it's just on its side. So even posting or reposting the programs wasn't an issue. Now I have recommended using the center of the round pin and the tops of any one of the four pads to establish your origin. And from there you build your fixture from there. I believe that's fixture Friday number, the answer right here. Uh, but when we did that, it just allowed us to move all our programs over zero problems, easy adoption. Now I love this approach because it allowed us to naturally progress from three axis vertical machining to essentially four axis horizontal with essentially no friction and a very low cost. Now, if you're interested in learning more about that, I'll put a link in the description and I'll pin the top comment to the page on our website where you see the finished product that is currently in production. What you're looking at now is the working prototype that proved itself the ones we're shipping are beautiful, they're dialed in, we got production down. Now, while I got you at this place in the machine, let's take a closer look 
and I'll show you some of the ins and outs of the interior of this machine. Some things caught us off guard. Now, if you followed our channel, you know that we are practitioners and proponents of people-centric lean. And one of the principles of lean is continual improvement. So I'm gonna walk you through kind of the continual improvement that we took when setting up the interior. Now, right here, you'll notice something odd, which I don't think I've talked about before, but maybe some of you eagle-eyed viewers have seen that we use air knives prominently in most of our machines. Air knives deliver a sheet of laminar airflow that we sweep across the bed in order to clean off parts so that the operators aren't standing there using themselves and completely misusing their time, their resources, namely brain power, to do something that a trained monkey could do, and that's blowing off finished parts. So our natural first approach would be to use an air knife. But then one of my guys said, hey, I ran across this old chip fan. Can we use that? Why didn't we think of that? Well, number one, we haven't used chip fans in a long time, namely because when you have a 30 tool carousel in a vertical, using a chip fan is another tool slot. But when you have a 100 tool carousel, like this EC400 has, you burn a tool slot and you use a fan. So we're gonna be retiring this, but really going with this, it's perfect because we thought that this would get close enough and blow it off. It's outside of the cutting envelope. It was a good first try. We celebrate our failures here. We're not afraid of failure. Failures mean progress, not finality. So we'll take this off. We'll go back to the chip fan that's been retired for at least, we haven't used it in four or five years, something like that. And we will deploy it to a dedicated tool in the carousel. Now, when it came to developing the horizontal pallet system, we wanted quick iterations. We wanted just to develop the product. We got everything right the first time from about here down. When I look up here, this is simply a working prototype using our off the shelf hand valves. We routed it through a simple quarter inch piece of aluminum plate and we bolted it down. We thought, great, we'll just make them like that. Well, what happened is we learned that this area up here, A, it looks ugly. I never liked it from the beginning, but B, it is a chip trap. It was really hard to keep this area clean. Now, if you look up top, it has one of the most impressive shower systems I've ever seen inside of a machine, let alone a house. Like I would want this in my shower at home. But even that wasn't enough to get all those pesky chips out. The new design, again, that you see on our website currently has a really streamlined look that easily flushes chips. So what are my overall impressions about the Haas EC400? Well, it's been a great machine. Um, I had heard rumors of nightmare scenarios. We have not experienced that at all. This machine, the cuts look beautiful. It's incredibly accurate. The, the surface finishes, as long as you have good tooling, look great. There's no chatter marks. We have had virtually no issues with this machine, except for coolant leakage. When you have a machine like this that has so many moving parts and is quite complicated and has a bolt-on six-station pallet pool, there are leaks that we just couldn't solve for a long time. Now, we didn't solve them, the Haas service has been really good, but honestly, they've been out three or four times. They finally got it down right. This machine has no leaks, coolant drains right where it should go. We don't have problems that we've experienced with our uh, UMC 500 with chip packing, I guess you could call it. My one thing that I would buy differently is that I would have probably upgraded the spindle. Now, this is the standard Haas 8100 RPM spindle. The reason I went with that is because most of our machines are 8,100 RPM. We cut a lot of steel, a lot of cast iron, lots of stainless. So we don't need those really high spindle speeds. But when it comes to aluminum, you just wanna run your tools pretty much as fast as you can spin the tool. So I probably would have splurged and gone up to the 12 or 15K RPM spindle. Um, when, you, when you're in you know, well over six figures for a machine like this, what's another five figures to upgrade the spindle? So the question, why did I buy the EC400 instead of one of the other brands that I really did take a long look at? Well, one of them is standardization. Uh, with the Haas control, we're used to it. There's no retraining. 
price was a consideration. I mean, some of the other machines like DMG Mori, um, Doosan, I looked at some of the Akumas, they're, they're pricey and you get what you pay for. So at that higher price point, I would probably expect that you get better performance, but everything that we've made here has been really tight tolerance. We make them just as fast as we would normally want to make them and we're okay with it. Now, as we've grown as a company moving from three axis, actually really inexpensive three axis machines, I started with a Haas mini mill in my garage to you know three axis, four axis, five axis UMC 500, and then the horizontals with pallet pools at upper echelon of productivity. It doesn't mean that we would stay with Haas forever. Those other machines, they're great. I have lots of friends, customers, and colleagues that have those machines, but those are much more mature companies. I look at Haas as like a great value brand. They are like the Toyota Camrys of machining centers. They're not the fastest, they're not the best, they're not the cheapest, they're not the, the um, most poorly built, but they fit a huge niche like the Toyota Camry. My last car was a 94 Toyota Camry that I put well over 300,000 miles on and drove it into the ground until a guy showed up at my front door saying, hey, can I buy your Camry? I'm like, yes, please. That's how I would summarize the Haas brand. If you have any other questions, post them down in the comments. I try my best to respond personally to each one of them to answer your questions. And if you have someone in mind that you think would benefit from this video, don't worry about subscribing or liking, just hit that share button, send it to them and pass this value forward. So until next time, go innovate your production.